it's called Tesar. Just by taking out one of the, well, like x1, like what, when, why did that change happen from a physical mass to a not necessarily? Um, well, LSD reduction formula involves a physical mass. Yes. Okay. The, our expression over here involves the Lagrangian and the mass of the Lagrangian. Which is not necessarily. Uh, not necessarily the same. Without some assumption between, about the relationship between those, we, we can't use these, these formulas simultaneously. We'll, we'll discuss that more. This is certainly a questionable assumption. Uh, this is a questionable assumption, and um, I'll have more to, a little more to say about that later today and a lot more to say about that tomorrow. Okay. Okay, so it's when we introduce the propagator, we say, okay, we're, we're now kind of using LSC, and because of that, we're not sure if the mass of the expression is physical anymore. Yes. So, so we, we, need that, we need this to make progress. And we can, we can make it work, um, but that will have some, some consequences we'll discuss tomorrow. So I don't get exactly where, um, why should we be careful about the replacing M physical with M? What, what? Okay, so the, what we have is this. This is what yeah. the operator in the LSE reduction formula. What we know is that if we act with Klein Gordon operator with the, the mass in the Lagrangian, then we get that delta. So we, we want to use that. We're going to use it. Um, we're going to, uh, and we, we can use it as long as this is true. And we're going to justify this assumption tomorrow or, or discuss more when, when we can use that as I mean, so up to the LSD reduction formula, we know that that's true. And um, from the going to the interaction picture, we know that, um, well, the interacting endpoint function becomes the numerator and the denominator there. And we know that we have a Lagrangian of interaction. Interacting Lagrangian has physical mass inside it. So... Um, no, no, we don't know that. Oh, we don't know that? We don't know that. Oh, okay. Oh, you just, you just said it's uh, one half m squared plus squared. We don't know what it is. We, we don't a priori know the relationship between the mass in the Lagrangian yes. and the physical mass. Okay. okay. And so we're almo almost there. Uh, we've got one integral left. It's an integral we can do. And it just gives us a delta. And so we get minus i lambda times delta, which is exactly the delta we ex we'd expect. It's the delta that says the total momentum, total floor momentum is conserved. And so that tells us the matrix element is minus i lambda. So we're relating the matrix element, we just Get rid of this or factor out this delta, which shows up in all processes. Um, and we were working to, to leading order, so there, there are higher order corrections. Okay, so we're almost ready to write down the Feynman rules for the matrix element, um, just generalizing our experience here. There are two things we need to consider. Um, one is how, how to justify this. And I'm going to make a claim. Uh, I'm not going to fully justify it today. I'll present a rough argument, um, but we will discuss it more tomorrow, and I'll, I'll fill in some of the details of why, why this is the case. So, in order for this relationship to work, for, for the process, the, the, the result I'm going to give you for the Feynman rules to work, you know, um, what we need to do is that when we are drawing Feynman diagrams, particularly 
next to leading order Feynman diagrams, we need to amputate them. So if we have a diagram like the one we just considered that has erections on the external legs, it could be any kind of directions, complicated as you like. Um, what we need to do is, is amputate them. What amputation means is we take a diagram like this one, and there are corrections on the external legs. If the, in other words, if the external legs has uh, has um, interactions with itself before it interacts with any other part of the diagram, we remove that. So this diagram can be amputated in two places. I can take away this part of the diagram and take away that part of the diagram. After I do it, I'm left with the diagram we had before. And these, so I'm, I'm calling this part a correction to an external line. And what the corrections to the external line represent are the difference between the free propagator and the propagator of the interacting theory. The propagator of the interacting theory is can represent in terms of Feynman diagrams. It's just the free propagator plus correction. There'll be infinitely many corrections. One of the first few terms. Um, and so we, we know something about the, the free propagator. We know, it, we know what it looks like explicitly. What we're going to see tomorrow is that we can actually make some uh, exact statements about the propagator of the interacting theory. Um, and what these diagrams do um, is they, they basically represent a shift. They, they represent a shift in the mass from the Lagrangian to the physical mass. And so by throwing out these diagrams, is the same as using the physical mass here instead of the um, air mass or the, the mass in the Lagrangian. And is there any way you could like walk us through algebraically how to see that? I will tomorrow. Okay. I will tomorrow, yes. Okay. So, so more on this tomorrow. Um, the, the result is, is called the chalen lemon spectral representation. And this, this result um, says that um, basically the throwing away these diagrams is the same as using the uh, Klein Gordon operator with the physical mass instead of the bare mass. Sorry, I've got another question, but maybe you can tell me this is for tomorrow too. Um, so we've got kind of this like infinite sum, right? Is this infinite sum the sum we were making um, that was like asymptotic, that asymptotically converges, or is this not the one that asymptotically converges? Yes, so, so in, in general, our Feynman diagram sums are, are asymptotic. So then, actually this is not a well-formed question, never mind. I was just going to ask kind of about the asymptotic nature and how you would eventually, like you'd think more terms would get you closer to the, the physical mass, but I guess it's just in the nature of an asymptotic series that that's not how it works. Right, so um, the method we're going to use to show this is not going to be perturbative. We're not going to use Feynman diagrams. 
Uh, so, so this is, is this will be a, a rare uh, exact result in quantum field theory. <laughs> okay, so I'm kind of confused. Um, so you, the 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 statement that you just made is that the claim that you just made is that if we remove all of the terms that have um, extra powers of phi the, um, from the sec from the second exponent of the, of the exponential of the interaction Lagrangian. Um, so instead of that, if you say instead of the m, we have the m physical. You want to take those into account? Yes. So there is no uh, perturbation or mathematical. Um, there is there is nothing approximate. There's not, there's not no approximations going on. It's just the, the exact result. Because you say that you're your diagrams and you're correcting the external lines so it, it so in that correction it, all the results remain accurate yeah yes yeah. so for two to two scattering we can think about our diagrams as having two parts there's the interactions of the particles with themselves before they interact with anything else and that part we can deal with exactly. But there's also what's, what's going on in the interior of the diagram. There's, there's infinitely many. And we don't have an exact result for what's going on when the, with the interact diagrams. Virtual particles? Yes. Mm. So, so we, can, we can deal with part of it exactly, but not, not all of it. Okay, so by removing the virtual particles in the amputation process, you're not? There, there is no. You're just getting the exact result. Right. You, you, yeah, we're using, we're using this, this result together with the LSE reduction. Interesting. More, more on that tomorrow. Um. Okay, there's one last thing we can do before we write down the Feynman rules. Um, just to consider the momentum conservation that occurs in these diagrams. So in our example, we were able to do our x integrals, and those just gave us um, deltas. Um, we could do the more x integrals, and those gave us additional deltas. The, the x integrals that show up in our Feynman diagrams are our expressions for the scattering amplitude and matrix elements are, are very simple. And we can do, always do them uh, explicitly and exactly. Um, so it's, let's consider what happens in general. Um, we know that we expect an overall momentum conserving delta. In intermediate steps, we're also going to have additional uh, momentum integrals from the from the Feynman propagator. Each Feynman propagator comes with an integral d four p. And we also um, all of the x dependence comes from the x dependence of these Feynman propagators. Th these will also come with an exponential of i d e dot x minus y. Um, we also have lots of x integrals. So we'll have x integrals from Ls z, and we'll also also from the vertices. So let's do a count, um, because every x integral we 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 do we can we'll get a, a delta uh, in momentum, and then we can use our momentum integrals to do some of those. Um, we use the delta function to do some of the, the some momentum integrals. So let's count what's left over in the amplitude. Um, and for our example, 
let's just do accounting for an example, and our result will work more generally, although the precise counting will be uh, slightly different. Let's look at two to two scattering, as, as we've been doing in 5 4 theory. And let's consider a diagram with V vertices. and E edges. These are what, um, before I've called these lines, in a moment we're going to consider loops, um, which also start with L, so I'm going to call these edges. Save the L for something else. Okay, so um, the diagram we considered before, this one, had four edges, one direct four edges. We're considering something more general here. And let's count how many momentum integrals are left. Um, after we do as many as we can. Or as many as we can, except for, uh, yeah, as many as we can or I am. So we're not going to do as many as we can in necessarily in, in uh, FSI, but in, in as many momentum integrals as we can in I am. We generally will have lots to start with and also lots of deltas. Okay, so the momentum integrals um, we'll start with. Um, we'll start with one for, for each of our propagators. So that's just E. Um, then we lose some from the vertices. The vertices combined with these exponentials will give us deltas. Momentum. Um, and so the number we're going to lose will be equal to the number of vertices um, minus internal vertices. We also have four from the LSE reduction formula. So V is just internal vertices? Internal vertices. This is yeah, LSE. And we're, we're, we're picking one out. Um, we're leaving one out. So we don't. It like this. Um, this is the delta that, that goes in the relationship between FSI and I am. Um, what is four without sight? This should be uh, it should be plus. So what we are left with is E minus V minus 2. OK. Um, and Euler uh, has a formula that says that um, you find a, well, the Euler characteristic of a graph like this is equal to V minus E minus L. And this will be fixed. At least if we fix the number of external points. I'm sorry. Can you say what X is again? This is called the Euler ca characteristic. And a key property for us is that it's it's a constant. Uh, you, 
spoiler proof this the mathematical results from, from graph theory. What is alpha? L here's the number of loops. Uh, three plus. Um, so a diagram like this has one loop. A diagram like this will have two independent loops. I, I couldn't, I could write, there's a loop here and a loop here. Um, they're, they're independent. I can't write one loop as a linear combination of other loops. And this, if it's like an Euler characteristic, so is this applied to like general graph theory and not, okay. Yes. Euler wasn't around for QFT. <laughs> yeah, th this is a purely math result. And we're, here we're just looking at the topological properties of these graphs. Could you go over what you mean by vertices and edges in the Euler characteristics for me? Yes, so um, this graph here, has two vertices, it says v equals two, two vertices. Edges are, are lines, so one, two, three, four, five, six. This is e equals six. Uh, and this diagram here has v equals three and e equals eight. Uh, and if I can the Euler characteristic for these graphs, I should get the same thing, so this should have I equals uh, V2 minus 6 is minus 4 plus 1 is minus 3. And the same same here. So is it fixed if you have a set number of like external? Yes. Um, I have a weird question. Uh, if, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, the thing that I recalled about the Euler characteristic w was that they're a constant for a manifold. Or is just a constant for any topological spaces? It, it's not just manifolds. It, yes, there, there's a, a version of this that for, for, for graphs. It, it works for any topological space. Okay. And so let's use that result. So the number of loops here is equal, just rearranging this equation. Um, is equal to, so chi is, is uh, minus three for the, gra the gra graphs we're considering. So the number of loops is equal to v e minus v minus three. And that's equal to the number of momentum interval. And while this intermediate step depends on the theory and which number of external points, th this is a general result that, in general, L is equal to the number of momentum intervals. So after we do as many momentum integrals as we can using delta function, there's going to be some left over. I didn't really understand why the momentum intervals are equal to number of loops. Um, well, Euler's formula tells us uh, tells us that this is equal to L is equal to to this. Um, over here, we counted the number of momentum integrals, and we found e minus v minus three, which is e minus v minus chi, uh, plus chi, should be plus chi. Uh, because this is minus three. Why the number of momentum intervals is equal to that? Uh, well, we start with e from the Feynman propagators. We lose one from the x, and also from the LC. Yes. Specific value of chi v minus three depends on the two G scattering that we're considering, and also the Lagrangian. Like, if we had a different Lagrangian or a different number of like initial and final states. Yeah, in, in particular, it depends on the number of initial and final states. Okay. 
how are your characteristic physically cut and is it connect to Mahmoud like it's something completely abstract completely mathematical how does it really connect um something and you just saw that the numbers are the same it's like yes so so physically the argument here and, and again it's a bit loose because it's dangerous to put too much physical interpretation in the, the finite diagrams but what we what we the story we want to tell, which gives us the right answer, is that um, this represents one, our class of possible histories of the scattering process. Um, and so if we start with particles with momentum, um, so if we think in the path integral formulation, anything that can happen in between could be allowed to happen. And in particular, there are um, diagrams that conserve momentum at these vertices and conserve momentum overall for which the momentum of the internal particles is anything you like. So the integral uh, corresponds to rough, roughly to, to considering all possible paths. Uh, squared by number of loops equal to E minus V plus chi is holds in general. Yeah, this holds in general. Is also equal to the moment, number of moments. Yes, this, both, both of these hold. For the, the part that didn't, doesn't hold is chi is minus 3 for in general. That's not. OK. I just want to make sure I get it completely. So uh, the Euler characteristic for uh, the topological space of uh, having two um, initial particles and two final particles for Klein Gordon theory with this interaction, with, with, or with the interaction Lagrangian. Yes. Would be minus three, right? That's right. Okay, so we're ready to write down our Feynman rules. What we have is that I m is equal to the sum of completely connected amputated diagrams with An initial and M final particles. And I wrote completely connected because in practice that's usually what we're interested in. They don't interfere. The um, this, um, diagrams with two or more connected components don't interfere with these ones. So in practice, this is, this is almost always what we're interested in computing. Um, so th these are the diagrams we can consider. And this, this is, is different from what the diagrams that contribute to the, the correlation function. So this amputation came from combining the LSC reduction formula, which we discussed in detail, and the Chalene Lemon representation, which we'll discuss tomorrow. This comes from, uh, these are the interesting ones, and they don't interfere with others. And then, then our rules are that for internal lines, we get the Fourier transform of the Feynman propagator. And notice that I've drawn the momentum uh, with an arrow next to the line, indicating which way the momentum is flowing. Um, that's better practice, because sometimes we'll deal with charged particles, in which case we'll use the arrow uh, on the line to indicate flow of charge. And so the flow of charge or flow of momentum might be in opposite direction. And for external lines, you get nothing. 
the external lines are, are amputated. The line Gordon operators uh, kill those, those propagators. Our third rule is for our interaction vertex. We get minus i times the coupling constant. And this, this one depends on the theory. Uh, notice there's no, no integrals left. We, we've done uh, almost all the integrals. We don't, in, per, in particular, we've done all of the x integrals. Um, there's always, um, we can always do those. The x dependence is it's just an exponential. So we can always do those. There's no, no x integrals left. Um, the next rule is we should impose momentum conservation by hand at each vertex. Uh, there, no, there should be no deltas. Because we've, we've already used all the deltas. Um, we've already done all, used all the deltas to do some of the momentum. I'll give an example of what I mean by that. Uh, number five, is having an integral d4p two pi to the fourth per loop. And finally, divide by the symmetry factor. So these are the momentum space Feynman rules, whereas before we were deriving the um, position space Feynman rules? Right. And in particular, for, for this object. And that object is, is the, the matrix element, which is? It's basically FSI. It's basically FSI. We pulled out a delta. Um, we, we could um, write down momentum space Feynman rules for the Fourier transform or the correlation function. Those would be different. They'd be closely related, but they'd be different. Um, we won't consider those in this course, but uh, in QFT2, we will. We'll discuss those. Can you give an example of how does the third rule depend on the theory? How does it change? Like yes. So for phi cubed theory, we had minus g phi cubed over 3. This was ln. Then we'd have a vertex three lines, the rule would be minus g. So I can that's, that's, we'd have this would be a minus ig. Okay, so the vertex can change. So the, the vertex, uh, which vertex so is, is present can change, how many vertices there are. In this course, we'll mostly consider um, theories with just one interaction term, but um, it's very common to consider uh, theories with multiple interaction terms. But still the SI minus I times the coupling constants. So That's right. And we ignore the, the factorials. Okay, let's look at an example. Get an example. This is an example of my four theory with three to two scattering, an order, second order term. And let's say our initial momenta are P1 and P2, and our final momenta are P3 and P4. So time goes vertically? Time goes vertically here. Okay, so um, I'm going to start with rule four, um, imposing moment conservation in each vertex. So I, sh I need to have some 
in order to, to use rule one or two, I need to know what the momenta are uh, on line, these lines. And I don't have enough information to do, to do that. Um, but that's okay, because I expect there should be one momentum per loop. So I'm just going to pick one of these and I'll, I'll call it K. And that, that's that, anticipating that's going to be the one I'm going to integrate over. And I picked a direction here. Our final, I could have picked K going to the left. Final result won't depend on that. Um, but now, once I've chosen this to be K, I want momentum to be conserved at the vertex on the left. Um, I have P going in. If I say this, is, this momentum is going out, P1 going in. So I should have P1 uh, going out. Um, but I already have K and P3 going out, so I need to subtract those off. So now I have P1 going in and P1 going out. And over here, momentum, I should find momentum is automatically conserved. With this vertex on the left, I have P1 equals P1 minus K minus P3 plus K plus P3. This is from the left. And on the right, going in, I have K plus P2 plus P1 minus K minus P3. And going out, I have P4. So this doesn't look like it cancels, but or it's equal, but the k's cancel out. And I have p1 plus p2, and if I move p3 over to the other side, I've got p1 plus p2 is equal to p3 plus p4, which is overall momentum calculation. So this momentum is conserved here. If overall momentum is conserved, which it has to be. Wait, sorry, what's the p there on the left side? P p, this should be 1. So now I've labeled the internal momenta, and I can go through and use rules. So I have propagator for the lower line, propagator for the upper line, And then I have one vert, uh, two vertices minus I lambda squared. And I also have one loop, one undetermined momentum. I should integrate over. And then the last thing I need to do is account for the symmetry factor. This diagram has a symmetry factor of 2. That's our result. OK, uh, this is a good, good place to take a break. Let's resume in five minutes. And I'd like to. Start to discuss renormalization. And this is a big topic, and I'm not going to be able to cover everything in this um, course. Um, you will learn more about renormalization in QFT1 and QFT2 and statistical physics, and also many other courses, elective courses throughout the year. Um, we're, I, want, I want to present some conceptual ideas and a, a limited set of, of, of technical results and, and, and tools, but we're, they're definitely things we won't have time to cover in uh, less, than, less than three lectures. Um, and today I just want to start with some of the, the basic um, ideas or, or physical insights that um, lead us to consider renormalization. And one of, the, one of the key things that goes into renormalization is the idea of separation of scales. And at least implicitly, we use this in essentially all physics you've, you've ever learned, this, this idea that we can deal with physics at different energy or momentum scales uh, independently. 
um, in your first physics course when you were learning how a ball flew through the air, you, you didn't need to learn about the constituents of that ball, how it's made of electrons and protons and what those are made of, and, or the expansion of the universe. You, you can deal with physics at the everyday scale, separately from the cosmic scale, separately from the Planck scale. So um, we, we can make predictions without knowing everything. And that, that's crucial for, for how science works and physics in particular. Um, and this, this idea um, is used implicitly throughout physics, but we, we really, um, it's really um, one of the foundations of why, why renormalization works. And um, it, it's, to me, the most um, compelling, compelling reason why, why this, this is what we have to do and what we should, should reasonably expect for our physical theories. And so with this in mind, what, what our goal should be for a physical theory is to make predictions for some set of observables, which I'll call O. Um, but that, that's, in general, not something we could do uh, exactly uh, at all energy scales. So really, what, we, what we, we actually ask of our theories is they should make predictions for some, some range of energy scales, uh, which I'll call E. So we have our energy here. Um, what, we, what we'd expect is that near some scale mu, we, we should be able to make predictions. And well, maybe there's, there's some other energy scales that um, the Planck scale, that's some higher energy where we don't know physics. Uh, and maybe, maybe there's something interesting going on in the infrared at some energy scale, 1 over L, um, associated with perhaps with gravity or with some large distance scales or low, low energy scales. And th this is our goal. Uh, I mean, Ultimately, if we want, want to have a unified theory of nature, we'd want to do it everywhere, but that's, that's really hard. And uh, concretely, almost every, every theory you've studied so far has implicitly been valid just for some, some range of energies. Um, when you first learned about throwing a ball and how it falls, uh, if you throw the ball so hard, it goes into the orbit or it... Um, Relativistic corrections are important. But what you learned in your first physics class is going to fail. Um, and the same is true for uh, basically every, every theory. Um, so in quantum field theory, we call theories with this property uh, effective theories. And it's, it's, really, um, it's, it's really what we're doing when we're doing quantum field theories. We're trying to make predictions in some range of energy scales. Now, often, we don't know how to do this directly. And and we might need to introduce some auxiliary qu quantities, uh, which I call A that might depend on lambda or 1 over L uh, in addition to P. And we saw this when we were looking at the Casimir effect. So we knew that the force, on physical grounds, very physical grounds, that the force between two parallel plates can't depend on the details of what's going on at very short distances or very long distances. It shouldn't depend on expansion rate of the universe. It shouldn't depend on Planck scale physics. 
Nevertheless, we didn't know how to calculate that force directly. We had to compute the ground state energy. The ground state energy did depend on, on these other, other scales. It depended on what's going on, very short distances, what's going on, very long, long distances. Uh, and this is very common, very common, particularly in quantum field theory, that we can't compute our observables, which only depend on what's going on in some limited range of energy. Uh, directly, we said we need to introduce some other things that might have some strong dependence on what's going on up here, up here in particular, and sometimes then. And in tutorial today, we're going to look at an example um, in non-relativistic quantum mechanics, how this, how this occurs. And it's all the same physical ideas, we'll see. Um, but technically, you'll see it's much easier. We can compute everything, everything exactly. And so what we're going to look at in tutorial is scattering from a local potential in one-dimensional non-relativistic quantum mechanics. So the problem I'm going to examine is scattering from a potential, which we'll assume is identically zero outside of some region minus a, a. Um, and it's non-zero here. And this is this is local. I call this a potential local because it's there's only it's only non-zero in some local region around zero. And so what we could study about this one, one property of this system that we could study using probes at a limited range of energies, is we could determine how the transmission coefficient for a particle that's incident on this potential depends on energy, assuming that the energy is low. That's, a, that's an experiment we can do at low energies, which is very analogous to what we can do in quantum field theory, where uh, we can't probe, can't probe the theory everywhere, but we can just probe it some region typically near zero. Uh, and so, compute the transmission coefficient. You'd expect that asymptotically, x very large, the wave function should should look like um, some coefficient a to the a i uh, p dot x. It's our incoming wave function. Be some reflected wave function. Be the minus i p dot x, and over here, which is transmitted. My function e e to the i dot x. And what we want to determine is t e is t over a. Transmission coefficient. So what we expect based on physical grounds uh, is that at low energies, we're not probing all the details of this potential, just probing some sort of average of this potential. Uh, I, if I added some high frequency component and modulated this, this wave function on a uh, very short scale, it, it shouldn't affect the transmission coefficient at low energies very much. Um, and in fact, what, what we expect is that the, the details of this potential shouldn't matter so much. We should get the same transmission coefficient if we have some exact model for what's going on at all energy scales, which would be this potential d of x for all x. That includes information about what's going on at very short distances. Um, we do expect that we, we should be able to approximate v of x in the limit that e a is small. This is a dimensionless coefficient, uh, that dimensionless quantity that you can use to characterize 
um, what we mean by low energy. So this should be something like constant delta. If we take a to 0, this is something like a delta. And we, we can systematically improve this um, approximation something in something in very closely analogous to a multifold expansion. And you'll, you'll show in tutorial that the next term in this expansion is like a derivative of a delta. And this can be systematically improved. And what you expect is that I sh you should be able to predict this low energy transmission coefficient from and these coefficients, c1 and c0, some order, and you go to higher order, c2. Um, we also could calculate these c, if we had an idea for what the model of v of x is at, at all energy scales, we can compute these. But only the first few terms in this expansion are what we could actually measure experiment. So this is, in a sense, a low energy effective theory, an effective theory. And many different models that give this the same coefficients. There are aspects of this potential that won't, won't be captured uh, in, in the first few terms that have to do with the uh, high energy when it's a very short distance properties of this. What does delta prime look like? Is it two spikes or? Yes. Um, OK, so delta prime so, uh, is, is a distribution. Um, one way to think about it is distributions behave nicely under integrals. So I have an integral of some function of x, delta prime of x, dx. I can integrate by parts and get minus f prime of x delta of x, which is minus f prime of 0. And in a sense, we can construct a delta prime um, as a limiting procedure, like we, we could do for delta. delta. Um, and so what we expect delta prime is, is it something that's like infinitely big and then infinitely small? Um, in a very small region. So delta prime, this is a loose way of thinking about it, but also a useful way. It'd be something at the very big positive spike and then a very big negative spike. So th this is what we'd expect to do. And in a sense, this has to work. Um, there's no way a low energy experiment can possibly measure the detailed shape of the of x uh, just using a low energy probe. You need a high, high energy probe to, to determine the of x um, on, on short distance scales. I'm sorry, yeah. Yes. Uh, so you're expanding out the potential v of x in terms of deltas and higher order deltas, delta functions. Mm -hmm. But is there an equivalent to sort of Taylor's theorem that says you can do that for some nicely behaved function v of x? Like, in, in principle, if I include all the infinite terms, mm -hmm. do I precisely capture what the function v of x is doing? Um, I'm not aware of a theorem like that. So, and if, my, my suspicion is this is actually an asymptotic series. So I, I don't suspect this converges. But um, this, is, this is a very, very close analog of what we're doing in quantum field theory. And the quantum field theory generally doesn't. I'm not certain about that, though. I could be. Maybe it does.
Okay, so the problem, though, is that if we want to compute the scattering amplitude, or the tra transmission coefficient, uh, in this case, uh, we can do it. There's no problems for, the, for this first term. For the second term, what we find is that it diverges um, if you try to compute it directly using this. So what we need to do that is regulate this expression, um, just like we did for the Casimir effect, where we um, produced a cutoff in the UV and the IR to make our intermediate quantity, in that, which in that case was the um, ground state energy. In this case, it's um, the, the wave, wave function. I'm sorry, how come it, why does it diverge? What makes it diverge if we include the delta prime? So, so physi physically, what we, or the calculation you're trying to do is trying to, with some given potential, determine these, the relationship between these coefficients. But what we know is that if we looked at this potential exactly, um, the wave function would be relatively constant for large x and small x away from the origin. But in, in the middle, it's going to, in general, change rapidly. So in order to match what's going on over here and over here, the simplest way to do it is by finding the wave function in the middle, which involves high frequency modes. So you, by making references to low energy modes only, um, at least I don't know how it, I would compute this. So the fact that we, um, our, our results shouldn't depend on the high frequency components. But is CN like definitely a high frequency? Like, wouldn't like each successive correction be a higher and higher frequency? And so maybe C one isn't super high, and so it wouldn't make it blow up. Yeah, it's it's not clear which coefficient from the level I'm presenting here, which coefficient this problem will arise. The show in tutorial that it, it happens at this order. So in order to do a next to linear order compute the next to leading order uh, correction to this, you need to deal with the high energy modes. But you know the answer can't depend on the high energy modes. You just have to use them in the middle to, to do your calculation. So that, that fact is, is actually very powerful. You know many features of the results. Um, and that gives you some powerful constraints on the dependence of are observable on, on our effective theory. Uh, when we replace the potential by delta function, so originally, if we were just working with the potential, we would need to impose uh, conditions on the boundaries of the potential, saying that wave function has to be continuous, the derivative has to be. Um, but if we, if we work with deltas, then it, it doesn't make sense to do that, because there is an infinite potential at the boundary. And the two components of the wave function will be effectively disconnected in some sense. Um, yeah. Yes. That 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 you're you're illustrating the the problem. So, um, if you zoom out, potential has to look like this. A goes to zero. P goes uh, or P goes to zero. Potential has to look like this. It means that there's singular behavior in the in the wave function. Uh, physically, we know that. There's, there's something. The wave function is not going to be singular. The, the potential is not going to be singular. But um, so there should be some smooth potential that describes the scattering. The problem is you can't measure that exactly. So experimentally, you expect to be able to measure something like this. Theoretically, you expect there's something like this, but you don't know which, what, what the details are. Those, the claim is that those details don't matter. And we can can still make useful predictions, but starting from there. Um, and just a word about the UFT analogs of, of what we're doing over here. So, in principle, 
there might be some some theory some uv complete theory some some theory of the microscopic physics in quantum field theory usually don't, we don't know that we don't have an analog of this v of x in fact it's very hard to write down something that's consistent in the same way that this is consistent high energies what we're dealing with in quantum field there is an effective theory like this and what our effective theories look like, um, we can do some very uh, simple or crude dimensional analysis to determine what we think our effective theories should look like. Um, so let's suppose, let's just restrict ourselves to Lagrangians that are the fine Gordon Lagrangian plus some terms that are ours in phi. And I'll just write down a few to see that. Okay. So we can do some dimensional analysis here. We know that dimensions of the Lagrangian are four. We're in four space time dimensions. Because the action is dimensionless and Lagrangian the action is the integral of the and that tells us that the dimension of field is one, um, because e phi squared have dimension four. Derivatives have dimension one each. So two plus twice the dimension of phi is four. And that allows us to immediately read off the coefficients, the uh, dimensions of the coefficients g lambda and h. So what's the dimension of g? One. And lambda? Zero. And h? Minus one, yes. Uh, and so, Let's see what we'd expect, um, how we expect the dependence on these coefficients to, how, how we expect the importance of these various terms to vary as we vary the, the momentum. So let's suppose that in the full theory, in the interacting theory, we have some observable that depends on some momentum scale, I'll just call P. Forget about the vector. The fact that these are momentum is a vector, say it's at some energy scale. Using perturbation theory, what we do is we'd write this as free operator at P, and we write down a series. Um, for if we only have the G term, by dimensional analysis, we expect we have a G over P, the first correction. The first. Uh, and we can have a g squared over p squared term. So at low energies, this term is important. For lambda, well, it's already dimensionless. And so this is, at least at this level of analysis, equally important at all, all energy scales. And for H, H has dimension minus one. So we do the same, same thing, same dimensional analysis we expect HP plus H squared P squared. So this is unimportant at low energies. Um, so 
we expect for writing down a theory at low energies um, only interaction terms where the dimension of the coupling constant is positive or zero are, are important at low energies. That, that's our expectation. Um, so a coupling constant which has positive mass, mass dimension is called relevant for this reason. Uh, that low energy experiments, these are important, at least typically. And uh, cu coupling constants with zero mass dimension are called marginal. Uh, this level of analysis is they're equally important at all energy scales. Um, if you do a more sophisticated analysis, you can find that actually might be more important at higher or low energies, but that depends on the details of your work. And we'll, we'll learn how to do that later in the year. In the other case, where G is negative, the dimension of G is negative, are called irrelevant. And we expect these to be unimportant at low energies. So this analysis suggests that if we want to try to write down a theory that describes all the physics we want to do at low energies, we don't need to, there's only certain types of terms that we should write down, namely those with um, relevant or marginal coupling. And that, that's what we do. So for historical reasons, these are called renormalizable theories. And this is, this is, I'm slightly oversimplifying here. Um, and then A relevant is non-renormalizable. The, these are historical terms and are not accurate. And um, you can renormalize in a, in a particular sense, even theories with irrelevant couplings non non renormalizable theories. Um, so if our goal is to look at the low energy physics, which is all we can expect, we should look at relevant and marginal coupling. And that's what we're going to do uh, in this course and in future courses. Even when we are considering the lower energy scale, mm -hmm. meaning that Absolutely, that's that's right, and that's that's related to the fact that in general we don't know how to compute these directly without making reference to something else that involves physics at other energy scale. And so, what we're going to find is that while we expect a theory like this with no irrelevant terms describes low energy physics. Um, we should be able to find some way to make predictions for what goes on at low energy, and we can do that. But we, we won't be able to do that without, without talking about going on a high energy. So the loop integrals will involve high energies, um, are just like our calculation of the, the force, Casimir force, involved the ground state energy, and that, that involved physics at high energies. So the loop integrals are uh, in like an analog of the, the ground state energy involved physics at all energy scales. And, and so that's, um, so, so these are the theories we're going to consider for that reason, because that's, that's our goal is to describe the low energy physics. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you.